Okay, before we look at problem question one in assignment six, I'm going to spend five, ten minutes or so reviewing. You should have watched the general topic video. So this is not an introduction, it's a review. And um, if you don't need this, you can skip ahead and find problem one. So um, answer these two questions before you look at my answers. What is capacitance and what is a capacitor? So pause the video and answer those questions. So capacitance is the property or ability of a device to hold or store charge. A capacitor is the device. The simple, there are many, many different kinds of capacitors, but the simplest one that we're focusing on is two parallel plates. So the definition of capacitance, the property, is it's the ratio of charge to voltage, and that should make sense to you, right? If a lot of charge can be put on a device for a small voltage, that's a high capacitance and vice versa. But the device, in the case of simple parallel plates, the amount of capacitance it has, the capacitor has, depends on three things. So pause the video and identify those three things. All right, this is the area of the plates. There's two of them, right? So it's really the area of one plate. In the simple case, they have equal areas. That's not always the case, but for us, the area is always equal. And D is the distance between the plates. And kappa is the dielectric constant of the material between the plates, where, where the material between the plates can affect the ability of the device to hold charge or its capacitance. So K for nothing, a vacuum, is just one. And K for air is almost one. Generally, we just use one. And K for paper, well, it varies from paper to paper, but in lab we use three. And if you look at a table of dielectric constants, you'll see it can vary widely. There's one other property to that. Let me draw a diagram. So here are the two plates, and I can slide a material between them. And since putting the plates closer together increases the capacitance, it's useful to have a material there so the two metal conductors don't touch, right? But there's a, I didn't discuss this in the first video. The dielectric constant is a number relative to air or a vacuum that shows you how much it changes the capacitance. But that material also has another property, and I don't think I discussed this in the other video, and it comes up in the assignment, and that's the called the dielectric strength. I'm not going to write it out. And the dielectric strength is the material's ability to prevent the two charge plates from discharging as the voltage gets higher and higher. So you can imagine as we put more and more voltage or charge on the plates, there's going to be a tendency for that charge to spark across the plates and burn through the dielectric. So the dielectric strength tells you how much voltage per unit thickness that the material can withstand before it's going to fail. That, those two properties, dielectric constant and dielectric strength, will show up at the end of the assignment in the multiple choice questions. Okay, so we know the definition of capacitance, the property. We know the physical factors that determine the capacitance of a device. And now, before we talk about what happens when we take several capacitors and combine them in different ways, let's just look at a few pictures or diagrams of real capacitors. So here's a wide variety of capacitors. You can't see the scale, but you know the ones you saw in lab look like this. You know what they're like. These are bigger ones. They can even be much bigger. So some of them look like pancakes. Some of them, a lot of them look like cylinders. And this is one where you can turn the plates so you can vary the capacitance. So anyway, this is a variety of capacitors and what they look like. 
So you may be wondering <coughs> how a cylinder is a parallel plate. And so the way you take uh, two pieces of foil, <coughs> you put insulating material between all the layers of foil and you roll it up. That's a way of getting <coughs> a lot of area into a very small volume. So all of those cylindrical capacitors that you see, if you cut them open, it would be two layers of foil and two layers of insulation rolled up. So the last thing to talk about is series and parallel. So um, <clears throat> draw a figure of three capacitors in series. Could be two, could be three, could be four, but let's do three. And the same with parallel. We'll do three capacitors in parallel. So draw those figures and then come back and see what I've drawn. See if you can do that. So the symbol for capacitors are two parallel lines, like two parallel plates. And series means that they link one to the other in a series configuration. And I drew three different sizes. They could all be the same size or not, but we draw them three different sizes. In parallel, this is what it means that they're parallel to each other. And um, I drew the three different sizes. Okay, now when we charge a capacitor, we need a battery. So we're going to hook this up to a battery. And remember, the symbol for a battery is a long line and a small line. And the long line is the positive terminal of the battery. And the short line is the negative terminal. And this will <coughs> charge the capacitor. And we can do that here. It's going to be a little hard to draw it in, but there's the battery. And watch what the difference is when <clears throat> this battery... So there's two ways of talking about this. The correct way <laughs> is that electrons move, not protons, right? So an electron would move from the battery here. And every time another electron moved here, the electron leaving the battery, an electron would have to cross the battery. So the charge, the battery is a charge pump. It's pumping charge. And it's pumping negative charge. So since it pumps across a negative charge, that means it takes away a positive charge from this terminal and this side of the... So in terms of electrons, which is the reality of it, an electron leaves here is pumped through the battery and then pushed over onto this plate. That being the case, <clears throat> since we'll learn later that current is the flow of positive charge, what we usually do is we think of it like, oh, the battery sends a positive charge here and pulls a positive charge off this plate and then takes the positive charge and pumps the battery. So the battery has to stay charged. It uses chemicals. That's the supply of energy that allows the battery to move charge around. So in general, we'll talk about the motion of positive charge, but keep in mind that the actual reality of it is, is that electrons are moving this way in the opposite direction of how we define current. <clears throat> Now notice what happens. <clears throat> now no notice what happens <clears throat> in the case of series capacitors. The battery sends a positive charge over here and removes a positive charge from here. Remember, the battery is pumping charge, not supplying charge. It pumps another positive charge here, it removes another positive charge. So by conservation of charge and that the battery is has to be neutral just like the capacitor is neutral. The capacitor is only able to charge this plate and this plate. It actually has no connection to this at all because this is dielectric or open space. So these two capacitors have to have, even though one is bigger than the other, they have to have the same charge. They just have to by the physical arrangement. And what happens is, since there's 
three negative charges here that will pull off of this from that middle capacitor three positive charges leaving three negatives and these three positive charges will pull over three negative charges here leaving this side positive so the net result is capacitors in series have to have the same charge so this is a rule this is a rule or a property of capacitors in series they all have to have the same charge even though they often have widely different capacitances and you can memorize this rule but it's much better if you understand the reason so that was what I just explained if you want to back up and listen to that again that's the reason the capacitors in series must by just the nature of the arrangement all have the same charge but since they're different capacitances having the same charge by the equation that relates capacitance to charge and voltage if we rewrite this equation for voltage we have voltage equals Q over C and since they all have the same charge but different capacitances <coughs> it means the voltage is going to be different <coughs> with the larger with the larger capacitor having the smaller voltage and the smallest capacitor having the largest voltage and if you think about it that makes physical sense because it doesn't take a lot of voltage or energy to put charge on a big capacitor it takes it's going to take a lot more energy to put the same amount of charge on a small capacitor and so capacitors in series have different voltages they're not equal and so what we say is that the voltage divides and so if we have a situation where this battery is 10 volts then when you add the voltages across all three capacitors it has to add to 10 volts and so the equation or the rule for that would be So the other rule for capacitors in series are that v, the, t the total of all the individual voltages will equal the total voltage, or V total equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. And these won't be equal in general. If the capacitors were all the same, they would be equal. And the 10 volts would divide into 3 and a third, 3 and a third, 3 and a third. But it always divides the total across all three capacitors. So these are the rules, but if you understand the physics and how the circuit works, you don't really need to memorize the rules. Okay, now let's go to the parallel circuit, and notice what happens in the parallel circuit. The battery sends a positive charge here, and it can go independently to all three. And so the voltage across the battery if it's 10 volts, each capacitor, since it's independently connected to the battery, will have 10 volts. So one of the rules for capacitors in parallel is that all the voltages are equal. And V1 equals V2 equals V3 equals V total. But since the voltage is the same, the charge is going to be different, and it should be obvious that the biggest one is going to have the biggest charge. If we look at this equation and look at charge, we see that Q equals C times V. 
So if the V is the same for all of them, the bigger C will give you the bigger Q. And it makes sense because when the battery's charging these three capacitors, it's going to, the same amount of voltage is going to be able to put more on the bigger one and least on the smaller one. And so the total charge that the battery delivers to all three capacitors in this case is going to be Q total equals the sum of all three charges, Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. Okay, so those are the rules. You can refer to them. Hopefully you understand where they come come from and how it makes sense physically. Now we're ready to do some problems. So here's problem one, but I just want to remind you, I hope you watch the intro video and the first 16 minutes of this video because if you understand series and parallel circuits and capacitors and capacitance, you'll be able to solve these circuits much more easily and I'm just going to go through the problems quickly and give you a few tips along the way. So I've chosen different numbers. I changed the 12 volts to 10 volts and I gave the capacitors just simple capacitances based in millifarads, whereas I think the problem is in nanofarads. So milli, you should know, is 10 to the minus 3. And we have a 10-volt battery. And notice that the battery symbol is a long line and a short line, but sometimes there's multiple lines indicating a bigger battery than a smaller battery. Um, so you'll see those symbols sometimes with just one long and one short line and sometimes with several. And the capacitor symbols are there and I drew them different sizes because they're different capacitances. So the first thing to identify is what's in series and what's in parallel. So pause the video and see if you can decide what's in series and what's in parallel and which step has to be done first. Okay, so these two, C2 and C3, are in series. So any charge that goes here stops, and these, right? Any charge that comes here is going to go there. So these are in series, and the, together, this series is in parallel with this one. So you've got to add these two first and reduce it to a single capacitor. And then you'll have two capacitors in parallel, and then you can add those together and you'll end up with one capacitor. And when you're first doing this, it's a good idea to draw the figures out. So the first step is to get C1 and C2 together. Oops, I just realized I didn't talk about how you add them. <laughs> So let's just review that. Capacitors in series add reciprocally. So anyway, go ahead and add those two together and come back. So the rule for adding capacitors in series are, is the reciprocal rule. And so we, I usually write it this way. And this can be solved to a simpler algebraic expression, but it only works for two capacitors. So if you have that equation from circuits or something, you can use it. But I prefer to do it this way, just to take this, solve it for C by taking 1 over both sides. And so I'm going to do 1 over 20 plus 1 over 30, and I got 12. 1 over that, right? It comes out to be 0.833, and that becomes 12. So notice I drew a figure. I've taken these and combined them into 1. And I call it C23, and it's 12 millifarads, and this is 10 millifarads, and now these are in parallel, and capacitors in parallel simply add, right? So C, so this is going to be 22, the total, and you might draw that circuit as well. So getting a little sloppy here, but here's the figure of these two combined, 22. And so it means that this 10-volt battery, if it were connected to a single 22 micro 
I mean millifarad, excuse me, millifarad capacitor, it would be exactly the same as a 10 volt battery hooked up to these three. These combination is equivalent to that. And so now we can find, the next step is to find Q total. What is the total charge distributed by the battery? So the equation I'm using is the definition of capacitance, but it's also the equation that relates the charge, the voltage, and the capacitance. And so if I want Q, I solve this equation. Q total is going to be C total, V total. That should be in there. The subscripts are important so you don't lose track of what you're doing. And the C total that we calculated was 22. And the total voltage is 10 volts. And so we get 220 millicoulombs. That's the amount of total charge delivered by the battery. But notice that 220 is going to divide between these two sides. So we got to find, right, it's going to send out 220. Part of it's going to go here and part of it's going to go there. The same amount is going to come back from here and from here. So 220 goes back and 220 goes out. And so how does it divide? The easiest way is to find this, since this is a single capacitor. We know the voltage, because it's in series, is 10 volts. We know the capacitance, so we can calculate Q1. So use this equation. Q1 is going to be C1 divided by V1. So write that down and see what you get. So when you, when you do this, you've got to be careful. Use the subscript. So Q1, whoops, Q1 is what we're finding. That's going to be C1. C1, that's easy. That's 10 millifarads. And the voltage. Okay, in this case, that's easy because this is connected directly to the battery, so it's 10 volts. So we get 100 millicoulombs. And now, since we know 220 was delivered, if 100 millicoulombs went here, then there has to be 120 here. And since we know, if you watch the video, that this plate and this plate in series have to have the same charge, these are both going to have 120, right? It's not going to divide. It's going to be the same because they're in series, 120 millicoulombs. But... Just to show you, check, use this equation, find Q23 for this imaginary combined capacitor. Find Q23 is going to be C23 times V23. So do that and see what you get. Aha, so the capacitance of that combined capacitor is 12. And the voltage across this single combined capacitor is 10, and so we get 120, which is what we already know. It just confirms it. So we have 100 here, 120 here, and here's where you may go wrong. You may get this mixed up, but the 120 has to be 120 on both of them. And so now... We know there's 10 volts across here, but how much voltage is across each capacitor? Go back to our equation, solve for voltage, and find out how the 10 volts divides between the two capacitors. See if you can get that on your own. Pause and come back. So solving this equation for V... We get V equals Q over C, but we want V2, the voltage across 2. So we have to use, be careful, Q2 and C2. So the Q2 is 120. The C2 is 20. And so this comes out to be 60 volts across here. And so by subtraction, we can figure this is 40 volts. But let's just check. Take this equation and change the 2s to 3s and see what you get. And there we are, V3 is going to be Q3 over C3, and Q3, as we know, they're both 120, divided by the C330, and that gives us the 40 that we were expecting. So it confirms that this divides 60-40, giving us a total, I mean, excuse me, not 60, 6 and 4, which gives us a total of 10. Okay.
let's go on to the next circuit. Okay, we covered that circuit was the first five and the next five of this circuit. And so I'm going to go a little faster this time. So in this case, the uh, C3 is in series with both of these in parallel, so you have to simplify this first. So you're going to add C1 and C2 in parallel. That's a 10 and a 20 is going to give you 30. And then you're going to have a 30 and a 30 in series. So I'm going to skip fast. And the 30 and 30 in series, when you do 1 over C3 plus 1 over C12, um, you're going to get 15 millifarads. And so C total for all three is going to be 15 millifarads. And then Q total is just going to be C times V, so it's going to be 15 the total times 150 millicoulombs. That will be the total charge delivered by the battery here and taken back by the battery here. So you can see 150 millicoulombs has to go here. So that means we know the charge on this one. And 150 millicoulombs has to come back from here. So this plus this, the charge on these two, has to total the 150. You see what I'm doing is I'm thinking the circuit through before I dive into the calculations so that I know what to expect. So don't just blindly do the calculations. Push yourself to understand the physics. And since we have 10 volts here, part of the 10 volts will be here and part of it will be here. So now, without actually doing the calculation right, we said the, the Q total has to be the Q3. And so let's find out what the voltage is here. So rearranging the equation, we know that the voltage on 3 is going to be the charge on 3 divided by the capacitance on 3. And so we have 150 on 3 divided by 30 on 3. I'm skipping the units. Leaves me, what, 5 volts. And so if there's 5 volts across C3, notice the voltage is across. That word is important. There's also got to be 5 voltages across C1 and C2. Oh, that makes sense, right? Because we found out that C1 and C2 are also add to be 30 millifarads. So the voltage across these two in parallel, that means that there's going to be 5 volts here and 5 volts here. So now we can figure out how 150 millicoulombs that goes on here divides between these two. All right, so you have 5 volts between these two points and 5 volts between these two points, it means there's 5 volts across each of those capacitors. And so the charge on 1 is going to be the capacitance of 1 times the voltage across 1. And the charge, I mean the capacitance of 1 is 10 millifarads, and the voltage, as we found, is the 5 volts. So that means that there's 50 millicoulombs of charge on C1, and by subtraction, or using this equation for Q2, C2, V2, we get that Q2 has to be 100 millicoulombs, and that we can be confident is correct because the 100 and the 50 add to 150, which is what is on C3, 
and so that amount total has to be on C1 and C2. So there we have it, all the values for all the capacitors in the circuit. Okay, the final circuit. We have our battery and we have our four capacitors and I'm going to use 40, 30, 20, and 10 for these with the 10 volt batteries we've been doing. So the numbers will be a little different. And so when we look at the circuit, we see that the 40 is in series with something that's complicated. And so then we see two in series that are in parallel with something. So this is in parallel with something that's complicated. So we need to simplify this first. So you can go back to the earlier video. We saw that a 20 and a 30 in series becomes a 12. When we do 1 over 20 plus 1 over 30, we get 12 millifarads. Remember, series, the result always ends up smaller than the smallest capacitor. But now this combined capacitor is in parallel with the 10. So they add, right? So the sum of those three is 22. Actually, that's the problem we did earlier. But now the 22 is in series with the 40, because we have four. So see if you can figure out how the 22 and the 40 add. They're in series, right? So the answer has to be smaller than 22. Go ahead, do it. Okay, so the 22 and the 40 came out to be 14.2. <clears throat> that seems about right. Remember, two 22s, way to check the way I check, two 22s in series would be an 11, and two 40s in series would be 20. So it's between 11 and 20. Okay, so that looks right. And notice I'm not going to round it yet. It's really 14.2, but I'm not going to round it yet. And so I'm going to use the total capacitance to find the total charge that the battery delivers. And the total charge that the battery delivers is this number times 10, or 141.935, etc., or about 142 millicoulombs. Okay, now that we know that, we look at the circuit and we see that the battery sends out 142 coulombs, so it all has to be there, right? There's no other place it can go. So we know the charge, Q4, is going to be this. But coming back from the battery, it's going to come off this one and this one. So the charge on here is going to be the same as the charge on here. So the charge on the 10 and the charge on either the 20 or the 30 have to add to 142. Notice I'm preparing myself ahead of time so I kind of know when I do the calculations if I'm getting the right answers. So let's find the voltage here because in order to do this we need to know the voltage here. So we know the charge and we know the capacitance. Find the voltage on number 4.
So to get the voltage across number 4, we rearrange the equation for voltage. Right? And uh, you notice I saved 6 digits. You should save at least 4 or 5 so you don't get a rounding error. But you probably don't need to save 6. Anyway, when I calculate it, I get this. And I'm keeping 6 digits. And since the voltage across here is 3.55 if I round it, then this has to be left across the rest of the circuit, has to be the rest of the voltage, the 6.45. So if the voltage between here and here is 3.55, the voltage between this point and this point has got to be the 6.45. And so that means the voltage across this is 6.45, and the voltage across these two is 6.45. So the easiest thing to do next is to find the charge on here, since we have the voltage. So do that, find the charge on the 10. So anyway, the Q1 here is going to be the C1, that's 10 millifarads times the voltage, which we calculated to be 6.452, so that's 64.52 millicoulombs of charge. And since we know that there's 142 that goes here and 142 that needs to come away, if 6452 are here, we can subtract that from this to get how much charge is on here. Or we can take the voltage across these two and find the charge. Both should give us the same answer. Go ahead, try both of them and see what you get, and then I'll show you. Okay, just okay, just to be sure you're not getting lost. We know that 142 here, we know there's 142 here. We know that there's 6452 on this one, so the rest of it has to go there. So if I strap the 6452 from this, I get 77. 77,415. But I know that there's 6.458 volts across these two, which is equivalent to a 12. So I can also do this, Q23, because it's going to be the same, they're in series, is C23, which is the 12, times the voltage across 2 and 3, which is that. And if I multiply that together, I get 77. 0.42. You see, you can see that those two numbers are not exactly the same, only because <clears throat> I didn't carry enough digits. I only have four here. But either one to three digits is 77.41, 77 77.4. So that would be the charge across here. And now the last step, solving for everything, would be to find the voltage, right? So this is 6 between here and here is the 6.542. How does the voltage divide between these? So see if you can find that. That's the last thing. Okay, finally, to get the voltage across here, I take the charge on there, the 77.42, divided by the capacitance 20, and I get 3.871 volts. That's the voltage across this capacitor. And if I take the same Q3, because these are equal, because they're in series, that's a 77.42, and divide it by 30, I get 2.58. So if I add that voltage to that voltage, I get the 6.45, which is what I know I need across here. And you say oh, it's 6.451, 6.452, okay, just a rounding error in the fourth digit, that's okay. Now, the last two questions are multiple choice questions, and I think that's all been discussed over the course of this video and the other video. So if you have any questions about those, just contact me by email. Okay, just to have a table of contents at the end, since at the beginning I don't know what it's going to be, here are the times for the various sections of this video.